and where thieves do not break in and steal. For your, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Please be seated. Mike this evening to cover for the gospel lesson while I washed my hands <laughs> so that I wouldn't be stained by the time communion uh, came around. So I'm in perfect timing. I was done right in time. So thank you. <clears throat> Yesterday was Shrove Tuesday. <clears throat> the word Shrove is derived from the word Shrive which means to repent and receive absolution. And from what I understand, it's also the last day before Lent that we uh, eat up as much as we can before we promise off or swear off something during the Lenten season. And so it so happens that yesterday morning was a gym morning uh, for me. And literally, about 10 minutes after I had gotten home, uh, one of the neighbors comes up to me with uh, a small bag of punchkis. <clears throat> and I gave in to temptation. And I ate. <clears throat> but I remember growing up uh, talking about giving up something for Lent. And I'm sure many of you uh, remember doing that as well. Um, giving up something that we are basically being repentant of. And though I repent of sweets, uh, that is not necessarily what we're really called to do in this Lenten season, this time when we have self-reflection uh, to think about what's really going on. Just six weeks after we celebrate Christmas, here we are looking at uh, the end of Jesus' life here on earth. And so what are we really supposed to be repenting of? There are a lot of things that each of us can probably think of in our minds, of sins that we have probably done that could use repenting. But when we look at the text that, that Mike read tonight uh, from Matthew, it really comes to bear what the theme is for repentance. As we do a slight review of that text without actually reading it over. Some of the points from that text are as follows. Beware of practicing piety before others in order to be seen by them. <clears throat> and this may be uh, a different version of the gospel, um, the Bible that I used to put this together from what was read tonight. But basically the same idea. When giving alms, do not sound a trumpet so that others will give their praises. When giving alms, do it in secret because the Father can see in secret. When praying, do not pray so that you are seen by others. When fasting, do not disfigure your face so as to show that you are fasting. Do not store up earthly treasures where moths rust and thieves destroy. Do you recognize the common thread between each of these points in Jesus' sermon? As a matter of fact, the, the context of this is the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> where Jesus is preaching next to the Sea of Galilee, on a mount in front of his disciples and hundreds of others. The things that we are called to be aware of or to prevent are things that are bringing ourselves the glory. There is nothing fundamentally wrong with sh showing piety or praying or giving alms or fasting in public. The issue, the point at hand that is talked about is this should not be done so that there is attention brought 
to ourselves. These things that we are doing, the praying in public, the fasting, the giving alms, those are things that are meant to be giving the glory to God, pointing our finger to Him. And so, don't read this as, okay, here's my permission to never have to pray in public, or to never have to fast in public, or uh, when giving something, don't ever let anybody else know what's being given. It's don't do these things for your own glorification. Do these to point to God. And it all began in the Garden of Eden with original sin. When man and woman decided that they preferred to do their own thing rather than to follow God's will. And it continues today. We sit in the center of our own universes. It's part of being human. We spend our time making sure that we are comfortable and we have what we want before we consider helping others. And that may be an extreme for some and not so much for others, but to give God, to give to God, is rarely seen as a sacrifice anymore today. It is usually whatever is left over after other priorities have been met first. It's part of our culture. We are less interested in God, we are less interested in our faith than we are ourselves. And it is the reason that we are guilty of sin. It is the reason that sin is a condition rather than simply an experience or an event. We are born with the condition of sin that we put ourselves in the center of our own universes. And for that, it's similar to a disease that we cannot control. We can never do good enough on our own to receive the glory of God. And so therefore, the coming of Christ, as we now prepare for this Lenten season, is a reminder that no matter how much good we try to do, it cannot overcome the bad that we do, the sinful nature, the disease of sin within us. And for that, only the blood of Christ is the cure. Thank God that he loved humanity so much as to change from divinity to become this human, a human made from dust, who in most cases returns to dust, but Christ himself did not. He was in the grave for less than three days before resurrecting which gives us the promise of a future resurrection with Christ ourselves. And it is where we are called to repent. This time of Lent, Ash Wednesday, when we repent, to turn around is a translation of the word repent. To acknowledge that we are sinners and that we don't always get things right and we never will always get things right, but that we trust in this promise that Jesus forgives. Unearned and undeserved grace. In the middle of our hectic schedules, we tend to forget our mortality. The fragility of life passes by unnoticed. It is assumed that we are going to be healthy and awake tomorrow to do our to-do lists and to go on with our calendar schedules. And I think that that's a good thing. Because if we thought about our mortality too often, it would be a pretty depressing world. And I think we would live in fear. And living in fear is not living. 
It is simply existing. And there is no life in plain existence. Living means to take risks. Sometimes, unknowingly, we are taking risks. We're taking a risk when we cross the street. We're taking a risk when we get on a piece of machinery. We're taking a risk when we reach out to love someone. We're taking a risk when we go to work. We're taking a risk when we're going into public places with whom we have no idea whom these strangers are, whether they mean us good or whether they mean us harm. Taking risks can be uncomfortable for most of us. But when we are reminded that we came from dust and the breath of God breathed into us life and to dust we will return, that discomfort can become less frightening. On this Ash Wednesday, we, rep re we repent of those storms in our lives that are sometimes a result of our choices. Sometimes bad and sometimes good, but yet they come out of our control. And in many cases, we walk blindly in our sinful dust storms of sin. Yet, Jesus forgives. And he promises that whether we can see through the storm or not, he's going to be with us. And he's going to guide us. And he's going to protect us. And even if that protection isn't in the way that we understand protection, he has promised that when we confess, we are forgiven. And that life in this world is not the end, but just the beginning of something so much more glorious that we cannot grasp in this world. So, here we are in Lent. And whether you're giving up sweets or television we're going out in the snow. <laughs> uh, this is a time for us to be somewhat disciplined in reminding ourselves that many of the things that we do are for our own convenience. And in many cases, we overlook others in that process. And so here we come for the next six weeks, repenting. God, we don't have it right. Each of us are a mess. And thank you for loving us anyway. Amen. Please stand as you are able for the message song, Be Thou My Vision.